Greetings, everyone, from Bangladesh Institute of Peace and Security Studies. Welcome to the new episode of Strategic Talk. Here, every week, we talk to an expert about contemporary strategic and security issues. And on our today's episode, we have Dr. Sri Radha Dattu with us, Center Head and Senior Fellow of the Neighborhood Studies from Vivekananda International Foundation. Ma'am, how are you? Very well. Thank you for having me here. It's such a pleasure. Thank you, ma'am. Pleasure. Pleasure to all ours. Uh, so the topic of today would be decoding the youth factor in Indo-Bangladesh relationship. So as of recently, both of our countries are harboring a significant amount of youth bulge and with a noticeable 24% in Bangladesh and 34% in India. The question is, are we using this demographic dividend right? Are we using our youths right? So what do you think about it, ma'am? You know, I mean, it's largely believed that uh, most of these Asian economies like China, uh, Japan, South Korea have had spectacular growth because of this demographic dividend that you're talking about. And, you know, the kind of economic potential with the youth bulge. And uh, But at the same time, the states have also necessarily need to provide for their health and quality of education uh, and employment. I mean, I think that's something uh, important criteria. So when we are examining Bangladesh and India, as you said, there is a huge uh, youth demographic right now. And both the countries are on a growth trajectory. Uh, but the problem just now and also uh, because we are you know, in the middle of a pandemic just now, we understand that one of the main criteria is that uh, while we always look at this group as one who will contribute so well to the economy, right now uh, there isn't really enough jobs being created. So employment opportunities are very, very necessary and I think that is falling short of, you know, so the, 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 there's a huge gap between demand and supply. And also another factor which also, you know, contributes to this gap in not being able to use the dividend well is that while India and also for Bangladesh, you know, we've transitioned from a large agrarian based economy into a much more modern service oriented economy. Here, I think the young people, while they have their smartphones and a different way of life, but uh, and they are not content to be, you know, with the kind of life the earlier agrarian based economy uh, social landscape was. So they want a different life. And the point really is, can India and Bangladesh deliver those dreams, those, you know, expectations? And uh, I think right now, the way we see it, I, I think there's a huge divide even between the rural and the urban group. I mean, uh, at, at a certain level, if you look at the HDI of both the countries, I mean, there are children going to primary school, uh, you know, but at the same time in the rural sector, while the numbers are also pretty decent, I would say for both Bangladesh and India, but issues of malnutrition, scarcity of trained teachers, you know, so the, you know, the learning outcomes are not as desired level. So these are kind of factors which will continue to play a huge uh, uh, role in how we are able to use this population. And I think, again, I refer to the fact that, uh, uh, you know, pandemic has caused deep crevices in the economy. So we've had a lot of youngsters and, you know, middle-aged and even senior level people losing their jobs, whether it's the automobile industry, whether it's the real estate, IT sectors, these were all booming sectors in India and as, as also in Bangladesh. So I think that has, you know, micro, small, medium enterprises have been uh, affected deeply. So this certainly is going to jeopardize the demographic dividend, as we say. And I think um, at both the government levels that in India and Bangladesh, there is an understanding of the deep issue. But I'm saying there is really no easy solution because while we are extremely excited and you know happy about the youth dividend, as you call it, but at the same time, there are no easy solutions as to how do you make them part of that and integrate them with the kind of aspirations they have and the way the economic trajectory is. So, I mean, uh, there are really, I mean, it's a, also very uneven growth, both in India and Bangladesh. I mean, Bangladesh's growth journey, of course, is fascinating. And all of us across the border, we are, I think, very, very overawed by what it's been able to do. Uh, but again, the problem, of course, is whether we will sustain that. And again, I, I don't think at a bilateral level, we are able to join the youth. I mean, we, we are bilaterally, both India and Bangladesh stand at a very, very good stable space and I think relations have, couldn't have been better. 
but whether we are able to draw the youth into this is something that we need to work on more. Yes, exactly the point I was trying to make and uh, we hate to admit that there's this two part of the coin. Uh, the technology is bringing so many positive energies and positive aspects for our youth, but at the same time, we have these negative issues as well. We are identifying fake news and disinformation that is emerging as a key challenge. The youth are particularly vulnerable in this regard and although at a bilateral level, India, Bangladesh, we have uh, an excellent relation. But some perception surveys shows and they highlight that there is some misguiding at a popular level among the youths. Uh, they don't exactly reflect the relationship we have on the government level. So what can India and Bangladesh do to solve this issue? And how do we bridge this gap between what the government thinks and, the, and what our youth are thinking? Um, thank you, Fahanna, for highlighting this very important issue that all of us are grappling with in some form or the other. You know, I think this fake news matter is actually a serious social menace that we uh, all have to deal with. And I think every stakeholder, whether it's family, it's friends, political communities, the government, they all have to jointly work together to deal with it. I mean, we understand that clearly fake news is are created by, you know, vested groups on each side. Uh, whether in India, Bangladesh, elsewhere, who are responsible and also many Western groups sitting outside the region who are actually all within the region but outside uh, the two, na two uh, nations of Bangladesh and India who are spreading such fake news. And I think here the, you know, the role of the security apparatus is very, very strong because they are, will be the only ones who will be actually able to identify and understand that where is this emanating from. And, and I do know that they keep, they are very smart. I mean, you know, these people who are doing the fake news, they use uh, technology very effectively and, you know, they just move from one IP to the other. So it's difficult, but I think they're, I mean, our security apparatus, again, both India and Bangladesh are working so well together on many uh, you know, broad spectrum, including security issues. So I think it's possible that both of us work together to identify from where these fake news are being spread. And I think a strong message has to go that, you know, this is not going to be tolerable elsewhere because we've understood, and, I, and I'm saying this with a sense of responsibility that we completely understand their political groups are also responsible for this, creating such problems. And I think the offenders have to be brought to books. And I think both the governments, the political leaders in Bangladesh and India uh, understand the gravity of the problem. And I, a strong message, once one particular offender is brought to the books, I think a strong message will you know, emanate and I hopefully will have a kind of a ripple effect. But it's a fact that right now, and I think the point that you mentioned again is so relevant that while at the government to government level, the leadership level, India-Bangladesh relations really is poised at a excellent uh, situation. I don't think we've ever enjoyed such a broad spectrum, positive, uh, ongoing, you know, uh, bi bilateral uh, relationship. But again, at the popular level, there is some, uh, you know, uh, misapprehensions, fears. And the, there are two reasons for that. One is, of course, while at the government level, at the highest political leadership level, uh, things are absolutely, you know, clear and they know what, where they are going. But there are certain outstanding problems that every two neighbor can have and India and Bangladesh also has. And again, this is that very vested group in different forms and different ways who constantly raise these, you know, outstanding issues. And often, I think, deliberately create, uh, you know, some new twist and turn, and uh, which, again, has a huge uh, influence over the youth. Because the youth, of course, are not, uh, you know, able to, uh, they not, not do they have the information or the knowledge of the nitty-gritties of the relationship. If somebody just tells you that India is doing this, uh, they immediately react to that. And I think, you know, obviously, I think it's the responsibility and I'm so very glad that BIPs uh, constantly take these initiatives where you're engaging with youngsters to clarify issues. So, and we must create platform at various levels, whether it's, you know, at think tank level, at university level, at other education sectors, at any other social level, also music, you know, uh, between India and Bangladesh youths, I think music is a huge uh, bonding uh, matter. And I think that is where we need to ensure that the youths are able to reach out to, to across each other. I mean, while the government believes, and I very strongly believe that, you know, our relationship is poised very well and it only can get better with time. But the problem is that the youths, of, of and, and both countries don't see the relationship through that prism. And I think it's 
we need to create more platforms more opportunities more engagement uh, you know relationship with them where a they are able to you know ask uh, uh, kind of you know they have a lot of questions inside them they don't there a lot of things that they not is easily available in the public domain that's also another issue that many material many information is not available in the public domain so they speak from a understanding of limited knowledge and which adds to this misperception and i think we all of us as a part of this community need to address and i think civil society role is very very important here where we must ensure that you know people to people exchanges are increased and it doesn't really take too much of an effort to do that you know whether it's a school children whether it's a, a college level children or even younger generation who are engaged professionally in different aspects of life i think we have to ensure that youngsters from india from bangladesh are kind of you know mixing with each other are able to ask questions receive replies and counter ask because you know while at the government level things may be well but you must understand the bilateral relation is largely impinged on the youth who will take this forward and if they don't get it right uh, i'm sure the relationship is bound to fall in some unevenness so i think to ensure that you know for both uh, bangladesh and india that we continue to be on this very very positive framework of cooperation that we are working on that the youth need to be engaged in this process they need to understand the whole gamut of relationship and in what it can offer and the kind of potential it has for both the youth to engage and do well for themselves in the years to come i must add one thing here uh, on the popular level why the youth are not reflecting the relationship we have in a bilateral level uh, is might be an, a reason here one of the central pinning factors of our relationship is the liberation war of 71 how india helped us through the whole thing and the emotional attachment the current generation harbors about india will not be carried on to the future generations most of these young people will belong to generation z the gen z and they will only see india as a foreign entity they will not relate to that emotional attachment that uh, the current generation harbors right now so can we still rely on this singular factor to bolster our bilateral relation uh, in terms of the popular or young generation level or do we need to broaden it no we certainly need to broaden it and i i, I really believe that we cannot rely on this one factor anymore because the generation who was engaged with this liberation war are slowly moving away so you know that the new generation i mean while in bangladesh i would say there is a distinct appeal about this historic event and you know even though there were youths who were born much later than you probably also belong to that or not probably this uh, certainly belong to that generation but i think the you know the important thing about bangladesh is that every family in their personal space in their official domain they've been able to you know capture this imagination about the liberation war about you know of course uh, 50 years of bangladesh and the kind of celebration that's ongoing despite pandemic despite you know there's some recognition huge recognition of that achievement and also uh, you know the economic growth and everything so i think every bangladeshi family is part of that process but i must admit that i cannot say the same for the indian youths i mean a i mean the certain youth who relate to bangladesh much more that is of course you know children who are part of west bengal who relate very closely to bangladesh for a variety of reasons also youths based in the uh, uh, northeast region again as you know there's a lot of interaction cross border movement but i'm not sure the children of the larger you know uh, mainland india relate to the war the same way that you know bangladeshi uh, youths do and I, right now the liberation war of bangladesh seems very remote to them unfortunately and you know unfortunately i have to admit that history is not a driving factor anymore for the youth but we need to create an interest for them we need to ensure that you know uh, the youth have a dynamic interactive space i mean like, but unfortunately in india or bangladesh i don't think we are doing enough to capture the imagination of the youth i'm sorry to say this and i think that is where the disconnect is connect is limited but we need to recapture that and we have to find innovative ways and there are possible that we appeal to that emotional connect so fact and figures can appeal to a certain extent but we need to go beyond that and see how the youth can also be part of this uh, very important historical moment that bangladesh is experiencing exactly ma'am and i think that should be our motivation both of our both of our country's motivation to 
uh, use our youth and uh, contribute more we can on this regard. And with that, I'm afraid that we are at the very end of our today's episode. And it was so nice having you. This was a wonderful conversation. We enjoyed it a lot. Hope that our audience will do too. So thank you for being with us today. We hope to see you more on our next episodes as well. Thank you. Thank you so much. Pleasure talking to you, Hannah. Thank you.